pensado profesor Floridi como designers, cientistas sociales, médicos, bioeticistas, doctores y pesquisadores en salud y colectiva de ELA y A, estamos empeñados en realizar una profunda reflexión sobre los impactos éticos de la inteligencia artificial en las instituciones de nuestro tiempo, en particular en no el ámbito de la salud. Antes de comenzar, quiero le agradecer por nos conceder esa entrevista preparada por algunos de nuestros asociados y cofundadores. Para efectos de una mejor comprensión para el público latinoamericano, presentaremos las preguntas en portugués y les llamaremos las respuestas. Quiero agradecer también a la revista Otras Palabras, que gentilmente nos apoya en la difusión de este contenido y a Prorreitoría de Cultura, Extensión y Vivencia de la Universidad Federal de Mato Grosso. Comenzaremos entonces con la pregunta del sociólogo de Saúl y doctorando en Saúl Colectiva por la Unicamp, Leandro Modolo. Profesor, las actuales transformaciones tecnológicas son vistas como disruptivas por muchos. Mas o senhor fala que a revolução informacional começou décadas atrás, cerca de 1950, e não é exatamente algo de agora. O que há então de efetivamente novo nos atuais avanços tecnológicos que faz a quarta revolução industrial ganhar contornos reais? Estaríamos nós na consumação da revolução que começou décadas atrás? Thank you, first of all, for the very kind and interesting invitation. The information revolution has very, very long roots. Um, I like to uh, mention 1950s because that's when uh, Alan Turing and the work around uh, computation began to have a deep impact on society. First through the war, uh, then uh, through the Cold War, uh, and then uh, later on through commercial applications. So we have the computer, uh, internet, the web, uh, and then social media, the apps, today artificial intelligence. has been an escalation of developments. Of course, one could say, look, the information revolution started when we invented uh, the uh, how to write uh, in different corners of the world with the uh, alphabet, for example, in, in Europe uh, and uh, in the Middle East, etc. Uh, so it's very difficult to say, well, it, it began on that day and uh, it's a little, a little bit like the Industrial Revolution. I mean, one could say, look, the Industrial Revolution goes all the way back to uh, the invention of the wheel. True, but the real industrial revolution as we know it is much, much later with the end with the not only the invention, because the ancients knew about the engine, but also the um, exploitation and the dissemination of the technology of the engine. It is the same for the information uh, revolution. The uh, the basics were known. Uh, is that thinking of uh, even uh, very old applications uh, uh, post Renaissance, but the difference that he made uh, dates to uh, roughly 70 uh, or 80 years ago. Um, as I said, uh, the real big difference is made by not so much the ideas, which might have been anticipated many, many times in human history, but the transformation of ideas into um, phenomena that make a difference in everyday life to billions, and I use the word carefully, billions of people, not even millions. Uh, at that point, you know that you are shifting a uh, paradigm, you're changing a page in history, and that page changed about no, half a century or a bit more uh, ago. Are we at the end of this revolution, its culmination? Not at all, we're just at the beginning. That's what I try to uh, also uh, remind my students with some enthusiasm. Um, the analogy here is, uh, I hope it's not too simplistic, it's like landing on a new uh, unknown planet, we just landed on this new digital uh, society, digital revolution. Uh, there's so much that can be done, uh, so much that can also uh, um, and should be avoided. Um, opportunities, uh, risks, problems to solve, and if I may just add one more note, uh, rethinking deeply where we come from. Because one of the problems we have with this digital revolution is that at this stage, we still believe, or some people seem to believe, that 
old solutions, because they work in the past, they can also work today. That is not true. It's as if someone were to tell you that because we live always in a pre-industrial society, now that we live in an industrial society, good old ways only need to be applied to the new ways. No, it is a transformation. What was okay in the past remains okay, but belongs to the past. It's a chapter we have written, might have been successful, but the new chapter needs to be probably updated profoundly. And that's why we're having this conversation. Olá, professor. Eu gostaria muito de lhe agradecer em nome da Estratégia Latino-Americana de Inteligência Artificial por essa entrevista e pessoalmente por essa oportunidade. Eu sou médico, bioeticista, um dos fundadores da, da ELA IA e a minha pergunta vem de uma preocupação dos nossos projetos, dos nossos anseios aqui do grupo a respeito de algumas publicações suas é, que vão ao encontro do que nós pensamos para a nossa reforma sanitária. É um projeto para o país que já se estende aí por quase quatro décadas e o que se pretendia era alcançar uma grande reforma social. Né? No entanto, nós ainda mantemos praticamente as mesmas iniquidades e necessidades que podem ser é, elencadas agora na lista da Agenda 2030. A partir das ideias de seu livro recente, né, é, que fala da ética e inteligência social para essas metas da Agenda 2030, eu pergunto se nós poderíamos esperar êxito de uma nova reforma sanitária, uma reforma sanitária baseada, vamos dizer assim, na revolução da era digital, mas se o Brasil não necessitaria antes se tornar o que o senhor classifica como uma sociedade madura digital. Isso não seria uma etapa anterior e necessária? Essa é a minha pergunta. Muito obrigado. That's a very uh, important point. Um, and for anyone uh, listening, uh, what do I know about Brazil? Uh, not much, but quite a bit, because half of my family uh, is yeah. Brazilian. Uh, my wife is Brazilian, and uh, my in-law and uh, that side of the family is Brazilian. So I know how um, successful, but also uh, problematic uh, the, uh, the reform has been uh, for many people. And Brazil is a big country, uh, people forget, and it has a variety inside the country that is staggering from the north to the south uh, from different cultures uh, i'm also speaking as a italian uh, just thinking about uh, the italian community in rio de janeiro sao paulo just to give an example so complexity is uh, a normal feature of brazilian uh, culture and uh, therefore health system now how can uh, the uh, so digital revolution and artificial intelligence help here I think we need to understand that uh, uh, there's some obvious um, uh, uh, solutions, some obvious impact, um, and normally that is seen in terms of efficiency. You can do so much more with so much less. So imagine having uh, access to uh, remotely uh, to good uh, healthcare. Uh, it doesn't have to be the no, the best care healthcare in the world, but just being able to consult a doctor when you need it. And you're far away, maybe in a small uh, town, uh, maybe in a state that uh, doesn't have many uh, resources or uh, a strong infrastructure. And yet you could be in touch with not one of the best hospitals uh, in one of the main cities. That is totally doable, digitally speaking. Uh, it's good for health and it's good for business, meaning you know, hand in hand, because um, more with less means that you can disseminate uh, and involve um, many more people disseminate the services at a fraction of the cost. Um, imagine having to travel or having to open a completely new hospital, etc. So this is what the digital does if it is um, governed intelligently. The second thing that it does is to enable uh, much more coordination. Uh, and Brazil is a, uh, uh, the right place where to highlight this point. You know, Italy is a small country, for example, and, um, and it has a lot of variety in it. 
Um, but you can travel uh, from you know, the north to south, uh, literally you know, by train, uh, in a few hours. Um, Brazil being the sort of uh, gigantic um, uh, state that it is, with all the you know, uh, federal uh, uh, complexity, needs more coordination. It needs to uh, be able to um, be synchronized, for example, on, on reforms, on opportunities. Now, this getting together, this cooperation, is what AI can do very well. But let me uh, sort of explain this uh, very briefly. I know we don't have much time, but sometimes AI is seen as something that you know, is going to do something instead of me. Okay? Or it's going to drive the car instead of the bus driver or the cab driver, the taxi driver. Or uh, it's going to do the job of, uh, say, um, a secretary instead of a secretary. This is true, and we come back to this. Um, but one of the things that AI does very well is to connect things. For example, make sure that um, if um, there is a uh, sanitary crisis in one corner of the country, or well, the resources that are in the other corner can be synchronized properly, that the right um, help arrives at the right time to the right people. Now, this is a lot of logistics, a lot of uh, how do we make sure that everything happens at the right time, with the right cost, with the right sort of effects. All this AI can do it very well. We just, as in the previous case, you know, to do more with less, point number one, and to coordinate these two tra trends in the health uh, sector are fundamental. What is needed is good governance. The technology is there, the goodwill is there. Are we up to the task of making sure that that's where we pay attention, that's where we are focusing, or are we distracted? We think, oh, you know, markets will take care of themselves, people will cope. That is my concern. So it's not so much the technology, which is there, and how good the technology can be in solving problems, because I think it can, is the human governance of all this. This is going to be a real challenge. Saudações, Professor Luciano Floridi. Muita alegria que nós estamos aqui participando desse debate. Bom, antes de mais nada, eu sou, meu nome é Ilara Amerli, eu sou pesquisadora titular da Fundação Oswaldo Cruz. No momento, eu estou é, assessora especial da vice-presidência de Ambiente, Atenção e Promoção à Saúde da Fiocruz. É, e antes de expor né, as minhas questões... É, eu gostaria, como pesquisadora de saúde coletiva, que é como nós aqui no Brasil construímos todo um pensamento, né, ressignificando o conceito de saúde pública, mas enfim, como pesquisadora em saúde coletiva há mais de 40 anos, eu gostaria de agradecer sua relevante contribuição ao pensamento né, crítico e propositivo acerca das imbricações da filosofia, ética e tecnologias digitais. E como cidadã contemporânea desse determinado momento histórico, eu quero compartilhar minha gratidão por sua trajetória em defesa do respeito à dignidade humana como um princípio universal. Seria muito bom se tivéssemos vários que fizessem isso. Nós temos, mas seria bom se tivéssemos mais. Enfim, Dito isso, eu gostaria de ouvi-lo sobre algumas questões suscitadas né, é, por pesquisas que eu desenvolvi é, mais recentemente né, acerca do respeito à ética em aplicações de inteligência artificial na saúde, cujos resultados fundamentam né, algumas evidências, algumas constatações. A primeira, que eu gostaria de ouvi-lo, até porque nos estudos que fiz da sua obra mais recente, dos artigos que o senhor tem publicado, é, o senhor enfatiza muito a questão da regulação da inteligência artificial. Mas nesses estudos né, eu observei que mecanismos de regulação, normas, códigos de deontologia profissional, dispositivos de auditoria, de aplicativos de inteligência artificial, e etc., né, entre outros, Lógico, são mecanismos e dispositivos fundamentais e necessários, mas por si só têm se mostrado insuficientes para a superação de riscos e ameaças ao indivíduo, ao bem comum e à soberania dos países. No atual contexto né, neoliberal de 
predomínio hegemônico do neoliberalismo, as big techs captura, capturaram a inteligência artificial, facilitando que a definição dos algoritmos ocorra de forma opaca, com o consequente esvaziamento da potência do gestor público e da sociedade né, relacionada à saúde dos indivíduos e populações em relação à soberania e à própria democracia. As violações éticas ocorrem né, tanto nos espaços de micropoderes presentes na relação cotidiana do profissional de saúde, do paciente, no interior de um, do estabelecimento de saúde, né, quanto na macrogestão do Data Lake como fonte de Big Data de um país com 203 milhões de habitantes e um sistema universal de saúde, o nosso SUS, patrimônio nacional que o Brasil possui né, e vem construindo isso. Essa realidade específica brasileira, inclusive, né, ela faz emergir inúmeros, inúmeros desafios e ameaças, até pela própria né, é, armazenamento amplo de uma gama incrível de informações em saúde de quase toda a população brasileira, ou de pelo menos uns 80% da população brasileira. Assim, gostaria de saber, primeiro, se o senhor concorda, com essa análise panorâmica que eu apresentei, e se houver concordância, eu aí faço mais especificamente a pergunta que, nesse momento, é a pergunta que me angustia né, e que, ao mesmo tempo, move as minhas investigações e as minhas indagações. Pergunta-se é, o senhor considera uma utopia ainda muito distante a incorporação na praxis da, da inteligência artificial em saúde, de uma ética que seja a expressão de um ato da vontade dos sujeitos históricos na saúde e não a, né, uma atitude calcada né, pelo medo das penalidades, por que ainda se coloca como a melhor estratégia para uma praxe ética em inteligência artificial em saúde ações hegemonicamente fundamentadas na racionalidade do dever decorrente do medo das consequências, do medo das penalidades. Ou seja, eu sou ético na medida em que eu tenho uma compulsão externa que está me vigiando e que se eu não cumprir, eu serei punido. Então, o que, que a gente né? Essa expressão, como é que nós podemos fazer essa transição dessa compulsão estética, externa para uma lógica né? de que, na realidade, eu trabalho com a ética e a, uso inteligência artificial de forma ética, né? não por compulsão externa, mas sim por uma lógica do querer, como expressão de uma compreensão interna. Ou como, né? Enfim, isso aí eu estou usando um termo do Spinoza. Né, na ética, acerca da importância em um projeto civilizatório para todos, de um respeito a princípios éticos no uso da inteligência artificial em saúde. Como estimular, então, essa transição de uma obediência a procedimentos éticos pelo medo das penalidades previstas nos marcos regulatórios para um agir ético? movido por um jubiloso optativo né, de um querer, né, de uma consciência ética, né, que vem de uma compreensão interna sobre a importância estratégica e estruturante de um agir ético no uso dessas tecnologias digitais, em especial para a inteligência artificial, que de algum modo né, é o que está avançando é, em grande medida. Gostaria, então, de ouvir a sua opinião. Muito obrigada. These are very important questions again. Um, I think at the moment the the strategy that we have is uh, based on fear, competition, uh, the stick rather than the carrot, uh, because we have been working on the minimal requirement, the least that it takes 
for something to happen. Let me give you an analogy. Essentially, we're doing what we're doing in the same way as we deal with our health. Instead of going to the dentist before, preventively, we wait until the last moment when we are worried about no, this, the real extra pain. We delay, delay, delay as a society, eh? not just as individuals. And then we take action. See what happens not only in the health sector, but imagine you know, what happens in the um, uh, uh, sort of environmental uh, problems. How long have we been waited for until finally we say, you know what, this is painful. This is going to hurt. We need to do something about it. So it is quite normal, it's human history, it's human psychology to delay something that needs to be done until the last moment when you have so much pressure, so much pain, so much fear uh, that finally not you act. It's not very intelligent, as we all know, uh, and we're all guilty, myself included. Uh, how many times have I postponed the visit to the dentist? But then you know that it's going to be more expensive, uh, more costly in terms of resources, more painful, less effective. There's some problems that will be irrecoverable. There's some things went wrong, like human suffering human uh, lives in the health sector or in the uh, environmental area. So sometimes if you delay too long, you will never regain what you lost. I mean, that tooth, you lost it and you could have saved it if you had gone to the dentist, da, 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 etc. So how do we shift from that attitude, which is the default position of individuals and society to a, a culture of prevention, of foresight, of not competition, but collaboration. I think that that uh, is um, a mix of a um, bit of education, as always. Um, we need to understand and learn more. If you explain to everybody, look, now, this is going to be uh, the price for uh, the dentist today, and multiply by 10 in six months. When do you want to go to the dentist? Okay, I go now. <laughs> so I didn't know. Oh, I didn't think about. Oh, you, oh, you're right. And so understanding education uh, so we can call that with a greek word paideia the other thing is laws regulations for example you might say like no this is an insurance an insurance for on your house means that you will be visited by the company every year that's a regulation oh i don't want to do that no but it's safety and the house will not not be affected and it would be good for you so regulations uh we we get them all over the place uh no on the road, in hospitals, uh, for the environment. And so we can call that with a Greek word, nomos, not rule. So a bit of paideia, a bit of nomos, but also I think that what is important is to change, and this is a bit of a philosopher speaking, so forgive me, but we should really study a 21st century way of transforming capitalism from a competitive engine to a cooperative collaborative engine. In other words, imagine if our society were to generate wealth by doing something good to the health of the people, the health of the environment, the well-being of what surrounds us. That would be amazing. You would have a fantastic, powerful engine, capitalism, which is now driving in the right direction as opposed to no more pain, more fear, more consumption of resources, less well-being. I think it can be done but it will require a shift in our culture that is radical, as radical as the scientific revolution, the renaissance, the uh, transformation of modernity into an industrial uh, uh, moment in human history. We're talking about a maze, massive paradigm shift. On the other hand, and I close here, if you look at the problems we're discussing today together, and the, uh, no, the health related, the social problems, the environmental problems, they're so deep, profound, pressing, that clearly, they require more than just, oh, you know, we do a little bit more of this, a bit more of that. They require a deep, profound transformation in, our, in how we live together and how we interact with each other and the environment. So, uh, am I optimistic about the opportunity? Totally, yes, it is possible. Are we going to do it? So far, I haven't seen people discussing this deeply enough. In other words, they think, okay, well, this is another stage of capitalism, it's another way of the health system, we've done things so far this way, we're just going to do more of the same. If we don't change their attitude, if we don't shift paradigm deeply enough, then we're not going to solve it. 
it is doable and the sooner we do it the better like going to the dentist go now don't wait for too long Olá, professor Luciano Floridi, meu nome é Fabiano Tonaco Borges, eu sou cofundador da Estratégia Latino-Americana de Inteligência Artificial, é professor do Instituto de Saúde Coletiva da Universidade Federal de Mato Grosso e pesquisador do Instituto Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia Positiva do Complexo Industrial da Saúde 4.0, sediado na Universidade Federal de Pernambuco. Muito obrigado pela sua entrevista. O neurocientista brasileiro Siddhartha Ribeiro disse, em entrevista recente à TVT do Brasil, que a inteligência artificial poderia realizar algo em comum, uma aliança das classes médias com os mais pobres em torno de um problema que atinge ambas, a substituição do trabalho humano pela inteligência artificial generativa, a multimodal, a robótica, que irão pressionar profissões tradicionais das elites de renda mais alta, operador do sistema financeiro, juiz, advogados, médicos, cientistas, e das tradicionalmente renda mais baixas, motoristas, professores de ensino fundamental, é, médio, é, assistente judiciário, agente de segurança pública, trabalhadores da agricultura, trabalho para médicos. Essa aliança seria, um, poderia ser um catalisador de uma renda básica universal. O que o senhor acha dessa perspectiva, considerando as convergências de crises globais, climática, a social, as profundas iniquidades de concentração de renda na mão dos bilionários super ricos, que desagam na política, com a deterioração da democracia liberal, com o controle granular da vida por uma plutocracia planetária que dirige as tecnologias da informação eh, de forma super concentrada na quarta revolução industrial? Muito obrigado, professor, pela sua disponibilidade, pela sua entrevista. Um abraço do Brasil. I haven't discussed this uh, with uh, 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 Siddhartha Ribeiro, so I'm I'm just basing my remarks on, on what you uh, told me. Um, let me put it this way: I think it's a it's a nice scenario, but I think it's unrealistic. Um, I wouldn't consider it. Uh, even remotely likely, to be honest. Not that I wouldn't like it, uh, but it's not really based on any real facts. Um, so uh, sometimes dreaming is nice, uh, but then you have to come back to this world and try to solve problems as they uh, really are, as opposed to not what we wish could happen. And so I don't disagree on the how nice it would be uh, if things were like you described but i don't think that they that's the way uh, they're going to develop no even remotely i mean there's no chance that's not the world in which we live um it doesn't mean that we cannot do anything about it um, but if you want to solve problems first of all you need to understand the problems for what they are not for the what you wish they were um and the problem with um unemployment and therefore uh, some uh, ways of coping with uh, digitally driven unemployment is slightly different um, if you look at the facts at the actual facts not not what we, you read on the newspapers but the, what is actually happened in the economies economies are um, generating more jobs now take the United States. Um, the problem that we have at the moment in the United States is that there are too many uh, jobs offered and too few people who can actually work. And that's why the salaries go up and inflation goes up. So it's quite a simple mechanism. There are many other variables, but if the offer of jobs is very high and there are not many people who can actually pick up those jobs, people can choose. How do they can choose? by asking for higher salaries. Higher salaries, higher inflation. Everything costs more, so the, uh, the central bank, you know, whichever country, tries to make money more expensive. No, essentially, if you go to the bank and ask for a, uh, for a loan, it will ask you for more and more and more. So uh, interest rates go up. Now, this is the real world in which we live. Now, this world is completely full of digital technology. So something is not quite right. So everybody's saying, oh, digital technology is going to make millions, billions of people unemployed. Not true. It was a, it was a simple narrative 
that you no know, was sold a few years ago. If you look at the new, the same companies, the same companies who told you that millions of jobs are going to disappear, etc. Just uh, no before COVID. Today they tell you, oh, millions of jobs will be created by AI, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what is the real problem here? Is what jobs? So the same company that sends home say a thousand people, and actually there is a real no Lloyd Bank sent home the same day eight eight thousand people and hired eight thousand people. So say, well, what was why was that? Well, because the people who go home are not the same people who actually get a job. The there's a whole generation, uh, people in their late 40s uh, or close to retirement, like those 20 years old uh, workers, so to speak, who have you know, some time um, in the job, who, if they lose the job now, they're not going to find another one. When I say that the market is looking for more and more and more people working, is either because these jobs, only humans can do it, uh, you know, if you uh, have a restaurant, you cannot have robots serving food in a Shuaskeria, trust me. That will not go anywhere. Or people with uh, other skills, like the data scientist, for example, we don't have enough people and we don't know where to find them. I mean, internationally, it's not just Brazil or Italy or Europe or the US, everywhere. So when things change so deeply and dramatically so quickly, the economy is you know, off balance. It means that there are a lot of jobs, and no one who actually can do those jobs. And there are a lot of people who uh, have the wrong skills or the wrong qualification, the wrong age, the wrong mentality. Now, that is the problem. And if we want to um, make sure that this readjustment of the economy is fair, then we need to help the generation, the current generation that is taking the cost, paying the cost of the transition, we, ha we need to help them. So when it comes to some income, some uh, sort of welfare solution, I'm 100% convinced that that's what we need to do. But not because you know, people will not have jobs, goodbye, the robots will replace us, so we start distributing wealth. That, 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 that is like, like that's utopia. It, it's never going to happen. But because you need to tax the people who are making a lot of money these days and use those taxes in order to help those who will lose their jobs and cannot find a job because uh, someone, someone like my age, 58, has been a bus driver all their life in an airport. That bus drive, uh, driver job is gone. Now is a driverless uh, bus. That 58 bus driver, what is going to do? Is he going to be a data scientist? Is he going to be someone who will not produce a website? Is going to be, oh, clearly not. That person needs to be uh, helped. But I hope the difference is very clear. It's not because no social classes will come together. They never did. They never will. The bourgeois and the working class, they fight each other. That's the real world. They don't come together. And there's not the case that jobs are being eroded. The work that we have available is not a pie. The view that no, from the past is like, oh, there's only a certain amount of work. You take a slice, robots, AI, etc. There's less for everybody. Sooner or later, there's no job. there are no jobs for anyone. This, this is just this is science fiction. This is like the earth is flat. Let me give you just an example. It's Sunday and you need to clean the house. When do you stop? Well, when you don't have any more energy, time, um, uh, money to help, to get some help, etc. But if I were to tell you, oh, when you finish, because there's nothing else to clean, it doesn't matter how small the house is, there's always something to clean. You can clean the glasses, you can clean the carpet, you can start cleaning the, the base, the bed, or you can start, there's always something. So the reason you just put a threshold is say, look, this is as far as I can go. The job market is the same. There are always jobs. Is that the threshold is that some jobs are not economically interesting. It's not that I cannot go no, on the beach and start cleaning uh, Copacabana <laughs> just as a job. It's just that no, no one is going to pay me, so I'm not going to do it. So maybe we need to pay someone to do it. So there's a whole dialectic here in terms of understanding what the real problem is and therefore what available solutions. We get the problem wrong and then we just, uh, you know, that utopian thinking, oh, I wish you now everybody were put together, uh, money, you know, kind of coming from the sky. Um, no, um, 
you need to understand what are the tax reform uh, reforms that you want. What kind of welfare in place? How do you retrain the workforce that yesterday was doing X and tomorrow needs to do Y and Z? This is this is the real world. There we need what we start our conversation with: good politics. Is that all? This conversation we're having is always ending in the same place. What are the people who have the power to make a difference doing to send our society in the right direction? If they're not doing anything, or if you think that utopia is a project, it's not, or the market is going to take care, it's not, then we have a problem. Professor Floridi, eu sou a Fabiana Dias da Cunha, designer social, cofundadora da LIA, e em nome da organização também gostaria de lhe agradecer por essa gentil entrevista. A minha pergunta, junto com a do antropólogo social chileno Hernán Poblete, tem a ver com design e filosofia. Richard Buckminster Fuller, vou abrir com uma citação dele, mais conhecido como Bucky, é, ele foi um designer, arquiteto, engenheiro, filósofo, inventor, visionário, que teve uma profunda influência na sociedade moderna, como o padrinho da consciência e da prática ambiental e ecológica. Ele já falava na construção de casas ecológicas e sustentáveis é, na década de 20 do século passado. Em seu livro de 1983, Grunt of Giants, ele escreveu, abre aspas, você nunca muda as coisas lutando contra a realidade existente. Para mudar algo, construa um novo modelo que torne o modelo existente obsoleto. Fecha aspas. De certa forma, o senhor já tocou um pouco nesse assunto em uma resposta anterior, falando sobre a necessidade do capitalismo passar por uma transformação, seguir uma nova direção, vinculando isso aos problemas sociais e ambientais é, ainda no contexto da revolução digital. Como, mas nós vamos seguir esse, esse pensamento nessa pergunta. Como designers e solucionadores de problemas, muitas vezes nos perguntamos se é possível discutir ética quando o sistema é projetado, desenhado para o lucro. Na sua palestra, A Era do Design, o senhor mencionou que a revolução digital está reontologizando e reepistemologizando o mundo. Também afirmou que o design tem o poder de resolver problemas ambientais e sociais, mas apenas se estiver aliado a uma boa filosofia. Então, nossa pergunta é como podem os designers e filósofos trabalharem em conjunto para superar as barreiras impostas por um sistema econômico que dá prioridade ao lucro sobre os valores humanos e o meio ambiente, ou seja, um sistema econômico que está cheio de benefícios perversos, como os economistas dizem. E como podemos realmente construir um novo modelo é... E temos ainda tempo para isso. Muito obrigada. I'd like to start from the last question. Um, we can, and we don't have much time. Um, let me just comment on this and then uh, the, the broader question. Um, and by the way, I love that quote. Uh, that quote really synthesizes exactly what we should be doing. Uh, build a new model that makes the old model, which worked in the past, obsolete. And the new model is a new model of capitalism. Um, and I'm not saying abandon capitalism. I'm just saying it's a great engine. You need to drive the engine in a different direction. But let me comment first on can we build a new model? Yes, we can. We have done that in the past. It's not the first time that humanity changes direction. We have lived for uh, a long, long time. Uh, in fact, most of humanity history, like if you take human history for 100,000 years, 90,000 years, no, ten, nine out of 10, of, our, of human history, uh, uh, as we know it, no, uh, is, um, is pre-agricultural uh, re uh, revolution. It's when we were moving around nomadic uh, tribes, 
finding you know, some fruit, some animals, eating this and move on and move on. It's only in the last 10,000 years or, or roughly, no, 15,000 years, 10, 10, depending on who knows the king, et cetera, that we actually started the with the agricultural revolution, urbanization, the alphabet, uh, writing, etc. We started the history that we have today. In that no, span of 10,000 years, shall we say, we have already changed uh, at least no, three times the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and then today the digital revolution. Can we change again? Absolutely. That's human nature. That is why we are the species, if you like to have just a, no, a, a non-religious view, or if you have a religious view, not so special. We are not determined to live the way we live. We're not dogs, we're not monkeys, we're not fish. The fish uh, lives in the sea and it will not change the sea. We change our environment for good and bad. So can it be done? Yes, because we have proof historically that we've done it before. Do we have much time? No, that is the pressure. The agricultural uh, revolution took millennia, uh, the industrial took centuries. This one is taking decades, so we need to speed up. We need to change gear. We simply cannot afford to wait in terms of human suffering and environmental impact, social uh, unfairness and inequality, that at some point, somewhere, someone will make a difference. It's not good enough. We need to be way more focused, way more determined to change page. So let's know, can we, yes, and do we have much time? No. How? Well, the quote that you uh, had, well, it's just perfect. We need to um, have a clear sense of where the current uh, model of a decent society, and I'm talking about Brazil, uh, Argentina next corner, which I visited uh, some time ago, uh, any other country that you may imagine, uh, but no, moving up, say, Mexico or the US, Canada, or moving on, on the other side of the Atlantic, Europe, Italy, uh, and so on. I mean, societies, and I don't know, Australia, New Zealand, etc. I'm talking societies where there is a decent democracy, a decent way of protesting if things don't go well, um, a decent way of having your rights respected, etc. All improvable, and everybody with his own problems. But these are places where people are okay. They think, okay, my country is not doing well. It can improve, but it's not a disaster. It's not a failure. So I'm not talking about North Korea. I'm not talking about China. I'm not talking about Russia, okay? Just to be clear, uh, where you don't want to live, okay? Um, well, those countries, uh, they, they should definitely uh, start thinking in terms of new models of managing their resources and their society. Let me give you a simple example. We have uh, no, some spots here and there, but for example, Europe has been uh, very strong on uh, providing good legal frameworks for AI. That's a good thing. Now in the United States, uh, there's more and more uh, talk about antitrust, making sure that these uh, oligarchy powers don't have the final word on anything. That's a good thing. A typical example, because Brazil is a uh, is a powerhouse when it comes to oil, for example. Well, Brazil could could still follow the example of Norway, where oil is a national resource. So whatever you uh, gain from oil, because it's oil of the of the country, goes back to the country. So our foundation, and then there's a, a mix between private and public. So it doesn't have to be the old model where. You privatize, you have a private company that makes money, not pay some taxes, but a lot of the benefits of all that go into the wrong, or no, just a few hands, so to speak. They don't go back to no, the Brazilians. Oil is a Brazilian thing. Um, maybe it should go back to the Brazilians. And I'm not talking about any communist or any, I'm talking about Norway, okay? So <laughs> a country where <laughs> there's democracy, capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, but there are mechanisms. It's just that we have little spots here and there so having an overview of what would, would it take, for example, to have an, an industry that is incentivizing green um, uh, policies or uh, a national health service that really works together with the, the private service. Now, continental Europe, France, Germany, Italy, very no, uh, different and improvable, but they have this idea that you can put the two so that what one does well, the other one doesn't have to do it. And you know, if the rich person can go to a clinic, it means that there are less people at the hospital. 
Now, if you look at uh, the UK, for example, or England with the National Health Service, it's it's a failure. The the, the list of uh, you wait for uh, months, years, and there are millions of people in waiting lists. Why? Because they decided to have no private sector whatsoever. The United States, totally private. If you are not uh, insured, you are in real trouble in the United States. You don't get the service that you deserve. So what's the best idea? Well, maybe a bit of a European combination between private and public, so that if you can afford more, well, you can go elsewhere. If you cannot afford much, you still have a very good service provided nationally. It's no science, no, no, no rocket science. Uh, you don't need a philosopher uh, to discuss this. It's bits of good models here and there. So the thing that I would like to add to your beautiful quote now, bit a, a model that makes the existing model obsolete. Don't think that the new, that new model doesn't exist. It does, and there are probably uh, sort of evidence of that model here, there, there, there. It just doesn't make a whole sort of uh, shift in the paradigm. So collect all the good experiences, make sure that they work, and build a new model that makes the old one obsolete. I think there's a plan. Um, it's the future that we need to embrace. And and, uh, and also, you believe that the designer and philosopher can work together in that? Yes. Well, I, I think they have to. Um, to me, philosophy, uh, the definition of philosophy is conceptual design. Um, we, are, we are architects or engineers that don't work with a hard, concrete uh, material, no, uh, but they work with ideas, with concepts, with theories. And uh, like a little bit like an architect, uh, we build and design uh, models of what, for example, a reality should be, uh, an interpretation of, say, art, um, a model for a good political system, uh, a reform of our ethical attitude towards uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, depending on the historical moment and the pressing issues, but philosophers are like architects. They uh, design conceptual solutions. They don't just ask questions. They offer solutions for those questions. As good architects know very well, design comes with constraints. It tells you that some things cannot be done, maybe because it's too expensive, because uh, that has been tried before and it doesn't work, etc. But it also comes with a wide spectrum of solutions. With a simple analogy, uh, imagine someone asking you, what is the best design for a lamp in the house? The next thing you ask is, which room? Because the lamp for the living room is not the same lamp that I need in the kitchen. And maybe the lamp in the kitchen is not the same lamp that I have in the bathroom. So, oh yeah, yeah of course. Uh, oh, then any lamp, no, it's relativism. No, it's context. The context helps to design the right solution for the right problem. But it's not true that any lamp will do. Uh, so there's, there's a, an intelligent middle ground between thinking that philosophy can do anything and the opposite of anything as conceptual design, bad idea. That's the opaque, confused uh, way of doing philosophy, which I don't really like. But also the philosophy that pretends to be a, like a science, like it's not an architect, it's an engineer that he calculates, that he says, oh, this problem needs to be solved only in one way and that's the solution. That's not true either. There is a space. The problem has a certain space of solutions. You need to find the right solution for the right context. That is what the best philosophy, at least in Western tradition, has always done from Socrates onwards. Find the right kind of conceptual design for your time so that you have a philosophy of your time for your time. That is the way forward. And it can be done. Designers and philosophers should definitely sit at the same table.